Assume that the f is an integrable function, and we look at this integral, right? This sequence of integrals, and we'd like to show that this converges. We can actually find the limit. Um, one important fact is that because f is integral, we know that f is finite almost everywhere. All right, that's uh, something we proved and which is important. And because of that, we know that xn f of x is going to converge to 0 as n goes to infinity almost everywhere. Why? Well, if x is different from 1, we have x to the n, and x to the n converges to 0, and it's time something which is finite. Okay? If it were infinity, this would not be a true statement. Right? If, let's say that f of x is infinity on some non-trivial subset, non-neglectable subset, then uh, this thing is infinity. It's not converging to 0. It's, uh, it's equal to infinity. Okay, so that's why it's crucial to observe this first. Okay, then you can say this. So the only point where you may have a problem is at one. But of course, any singleton has Lebesgue measure zero, so you can just throw that away, and you throw away the, the point where your function is infinite, which by assumption have measure zero. So you put together all these measure zero sets, well, two of them, and you get a measure zero set. So this is one part. The other part is that x and f of x is less than f of x in absolute value. And this thing is integrable by assumption. Therefore, you can use a dominated convergence theorem and to, to say that your limit as n goes to infinity The limit can be put inside and therefore your limit is zero. Number two. So we want to show that. So I guess. and goes to infinity of Fn exists and is finite if and only if mu of f bigger than 1 is 0. Okay, did we assume something else on f? It's a positive function. Okay. okay so um, let's let's do this direction first. Let's assume that mu of f bigger than one is zero. Then we get that our f. is equal to this almost everywhere. Right? We can just restrict uh, ourselves to f of x being less than 1. Because uh, they are not equal when f is bigger than 1. And that has measure 0. 
so we have this. If we have this, then we can. Uh, did, did we also assume that mu of x uh, is finite? Yeah. So given that we can say the following, well, fn f less than 1 is actually less than 1. Because this thing is either 0 when f is bigger than 1, or I have something less than 1 to the power n, so this is less than 1. Now, this guy here is integral because when I integrate 1, I get mu of x. And that's where mu of x finite is important. Okay? So it's integral because mu of x is finite. So I can use the dominated convergence theorem to uh, say the following that so the dominated yeah actually I should do things a little differently to uh, to get a more precise result. Okay, so okay, what I want to do is the following. So let's uh, okay. Le let's look at the strict inequality for the time being, and we have this. Strictly, in fact, but that doesn't matter. Uh, let's look at this guy here, and then what? So before applying the dominated convergence theorem, uh, we can we we can observe a that fn, when f is strictly less than 1, uh, goes to 0. Because my, uh, for every x here, either f of x is 0, and this is actually 0, so of course it goes to 0, or it's strictly less than 1, and to the power n, so this goes to 0. And I don't need absolute value since we're assuming that this thing is positive. So this is 0. The dominated convergence theorem applies. And so the, the integral of fn for on f less than 1 converges to 0. Now, I'm not quite done because so now we, we can write things. I can write that uh, fn d mu is fn or f equal 1 d mu plus fn on f less than 1 d mu. And I just get rid of a part strictly larger than 1 because I know that part has an integral equal to 0. Now, this part is exactly 1, so this is mu of f equal 1. And that's a constant. Plus, this part here, but this part I, had, I have just proved that this part goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. So I'm left with my limit is actually equal to this guy. If you didn't do it this way, if you just kept the large inequality, that's fine. You proved that you had a limit. Uh, but you don't get this result, which is more precise. Here I tell you what the limit is. 
okay, is the measure of x where your function is equal to 1. And this may or may not be 0. Questions? Okay, if I have a constant 1, for instance, this will just be uh, whatever mu of x is. If I have something else, then it, it, I, mean, I, I may get to all kinds of different numbers here. So that's uh, the, direct, uh, the indirect implication. Now let's look at the other direction. The other direction is that this limit exists. So uh, first thing, I'm going to split the integral. Right. So what I'm going to do is look at fn and say that it's bigger than fn. Uh, let's write. Is equal to fn f bigger than a plus fn f less than a. Okay, I can split my domain in two pieces like that. And this, because I'm assuming that my function is positive, this guy is bigger, I, I just get rid of this, and I get this. Okay, this integral is positive. It's the integral of a positive function. So if I get rid of it, I get something smaller. Now, because I'm, I'm on the domain f bigger than a, this is larger than a n d mu. And this is a constant, so I get that this guy is a n mu of f bigger than a. So putting things together, the inequality I just proved is that the integral of f n is bigger than a n mu of f bigger than a. Now assume for a second that mu is mu of f bigger than a is strictly positive. It's not zero. Then uh, for, for some a is strictly bigger than 1. Then a n mu of f bigger than a goes to infinity. And so my sequence here is not bounded, and therefore cannot converge. I get a contradiction. OK, because my assumption is that this sequence is converging to a finite limit. That's what my assumption is. So this cannot happen. Therefore. mu of f bigger than a must be 0 for every a bigger than 1. And now we want to go all the way down to 1. So we take a sequence. We say, for instance, well, mu of f bigger than 1 plus 1 over n must be 0 for every n. And we call a n f bigger than 1 plus 1 over n. And what's remarkable about the sequence a n? Is it increasing, decreasing, neither? 
it's increasing, right? It's easier and easier to be bigger than 1 plus 1 over n as your n goes to infinity. Okay? So this is an increasing sequence. And when our sequence is increasing, we can pass to the limit. We can say, therefore, that the limit of mu of a n is mu of the union of a n. So mu of the union of a n, I claim, well, actually, before we, we take v, mu, the union of a n for n bigger than 1 is f strictly bigger than 1. So let's prove that. So one inclusion is clear because each a n is included in f bigger than 1. Okay, if you are bigger than 1 plus 1 over n, of course you are bigger than 1. So this side is clear. Now for the other inclusion, let's take x belonging to f bigger than 1, which means that f of x is strictly bigger than 1. Then uh, this implies that there must be, there exists at least an n such that f of x is bigger than 1 plus 1 over n. And that's a direct consequence of the Archimedean property. Okay, because the, the way this is equivalent to n bigger than 1 over 1 minus f, f of x. So by the Archimedean property, you have such an n, and therefore you, uh, it's f of x minus 1. OK? So uh, we have this, which means that uh, x belongs to a n for this particular n, a n. And therefore, it belongs to the union. So uh, which tells us that because each one of these guys here is 0, the limit is 0, and mu of the union is 0. And therefore, so mu of the union of a n is 0, which means that mu of f bigger than 1 is 0, which means that f is less than 1 almost everywhere. Okay, now we get to the infamous number three. So, Fn are positive. Fn converges to F, and we are asked to look at Fn exponential minus Fn. As n goes to infinity. Now the key here is to look at the function phi. which is x exponential minus x. And 
if we look at this function, we see we take the derivative of course this is differentiable. And we factor, this is what we get. And let's look at the function of the positive rails because that's where we're interested. So we see that we have an extremum at one. And we see that uh, it is positive here, phi prime. So this is x. And phi prime is positive and negative. And therefore, phi must be increasing and then decreasing. Therefore, we have a maximum at 1, Okay, an absolute maximum. And so uh, the maximum of phi for x in 0 infinity is the value of a function at 1, which is exponential minus 1. So now what we do is we look at fn exponential minus fn. Well, this is less than exponential minus 1. Because it doesn't matter what we have here. If it's a positive number, x exponential minus x is less than exponential minus 1, whatever x is. You seem to kind of have believed me. Do we agree? Well, another way to write this. Uh, this is phi of fn of x. And phi of whatever is always less than exponential minus 1. Provide, provided the thing inside here is positive, which is the case. OK, that's all. OK? Another thing is that if fn of x converges to f of x, then phi of fn, fn of x converges to phi of f of x. What property am I using? Continuity of phi. Phi is a continuous function. So I know that this is true almost everywhere. That's my hypothesis. Therefore, this must be true almost everywhere as well. OK? So fn exponential minus fn converges to f exponential minus f almost everywhere by continuity of the function phi. So we have everything. Uh, well, one thing we should have noted here is that this thing is integral. Okay, if you find a beautiful bound, but it's not integral, you haven't done anything. You cannot use the dominated convergence theorem. So always check that your bound is indeed uh, integrable and it's your constant is fine provided your space has finite measure otherwise it's not fine okay because it's not going to be integrable and so it's integrable because we are on zero one okay uh, if you do this is what you get so now we can use the dominated convergence theorem. And you can say that the limit sign of Fn exponential minus Fn is
this. And you are done. Okay, the second part is just a, uh, so this is B, I guess. The second part is just uh, an easy uh, application of a monotone convergence theorem that we proved in class. And that says the following, that if the GN are positive and uh, measurable, then the sum the integral of the series is equal to the series of the integral. Okay, you can look at your notes. It's a direct uh, application of a monotone convergence theorem because your partial sum is an increasing sequence. Okay, so now you, you use that for fn squared. That's all. Well, you can also, of course, say that because you are composing fn with a continuous function, you get a measurable function. Or fn squared is the product of two measurable functions, therefore it's measurable. Okay, that's, that's the only thing to, to check, that you, you are indeed working with positive measurable functions. Number four, uh, number four is, yeah, this thing here. Okay, we want to look at this sequence. Um, the bounded convergence theorem is, uh, is uh, the theorem of choice because, I mean, many times it's easier to bound something rather than show that it's an increasing sequence. But here it's not so easy, I think, to... Um, See how we could do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you cannot avoid uh, computing this limit, basically. That's, that's not really... Uh, you cannot do anything. Now, if, you, if we can show that this is an increasing sequence in N, since this is also increasing, we can use the monotone convergence theorem because all that is positive. Okay? So let's do that. And well, I have a strange uh, argument for this, but anyway, so let's, let's do it. Uh, so the problem is to show that this thing is increasing in N. And what I'm going to do is take logs. So if we take the log of 1 minus x over N, and I'm going to, OK, maybe. So the first thing is to use the geometric series. And then, uh, well, 
we, we can take uh, antiderivatives on both sides. K, and we should not use N. Let's use K here. And uh, I'm going to use this guy here. And for this to be valid, we need to have x less than, than n, which is fine. It's, uh, it's n that's that we are going to let go to infinity, so that's not a problem. Then uh, we multiply a cross by n, so n log of 1 minus x over n is equal to minus sum xk plus 1 uh, and k 1 over k plus 1. Now each one of these guys, so when we look at minus xk plus 1 over n k, this is increasing in n. Right? Because 1 over n is decreasing, then you raise to the power k, it's still decreasing, and then you multiply by minus 1, and you get an increasing function. So that's increasing in n, and you are, you are summing them, so it's, it's going to, to be an increasing function. Okay? So and ln 1 minus x over n is increasing in n. And when you take the exponential, you get 1 minus x over n over n is also increasing in n. So now, uh, OK, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is that you can compute this limit. It's where I'm doing it. So you can compute this guy by doing the following. You can simply say uh, that, OK. So another parenthesis, if you do uh, ln of 1 minus x minus ln of 1 over uh, x, What you're doing is f of x minus f of 0 over x minus 0, where your function f is uh, ln of 1 minus x. And this thing is differentiable. f is differentiable, so f of x minus f of 0 over x minus 0 converges to f prime of 0. And f prime of 0 is minus 1 over 1 minus x, taken at x equals 0, which is minus 1. So when we're doing uh, ln 1 minus x over n over, uh, well, times, times n, we can think of this as being ln 1 minus x over n over x over n uh, times x. So this thing we have just shown converges to minus 1 as n goes to infinity which is the same as 
so here I'm letting x go to 0. And here x is fixed, but n is going to, to infinity. Therefore, x over n is going to 0. So this goes to minus 1 times x. So my limit is minus x. I take expo exponentials, and I get that 1 minus x over n to the n converges to exponential minus x. So it's an increasing sequence converging to exponential minus x. Now we can finally uh, use the monotone convergence theorem. by saying the following, 1, 0, n uh, times 1 minus x over n to the n, exponential x over 2, converges as n goes to infinity to 1, 0, infinity, exponential minus x, exponential x over 2. And it's an increasing sequence. So the limit of 0 and x uh, 1 minus x over n to the n, exponential of x over 2 dm, is equal, monotone convergence theorem, to 0 infinity, exponential minus x, exponential x over 2 the n. So that's going to be uh, 0 infinity exponential minus x over 2 the n. And we need to compute this thing. Now, we say that provided our, our function is regular enough, which of course is the case, this, this is continuous, provided our function is continuous, except possibly on a Lebesgue measure, on, on a zero, on an offset for the Lebesgue measure, we can uh, just use, it's just a Riemann integral. However, this is true for a bounded interval. Okay, so maybe we should uh, we should do a little lemma here. So what uh, what would we have? So we if we have a function f which is positive and which is uh, Riemann integrable on zero infinity. Well, the improper integral converges. This is what I mean. Then the two integrals, the two integrals con coincide. So we get that this. Uh, is equal to this. And that's, that's easy. It's again the monotone convergence theorem because the only thing we need to do is look at 0 n f the n, and that converges to 0 infinity f dm by the monotone convergence theorem. Then this part here converges to, is equal to, the Riemann integral, because that's, that has been proved already, that if the function is regular, the Riemann integral and the Lebesgue integral are the same thing on a bounded integral, which is the case here. And then we are assuming that this improper integral has a limit, 
So this converges to this. That's, that's the hypothesis. Therefore, these two things are the same. There are a problem with uh, improper integrals because uh, for, uh, for Lebesgue integration, you take absolute values. And for Riemann integrals, it may change the result. A function may be integrable. Uh, an improper uh, integral may converge. Well, I'll give you an example. It's, uh, it's easier. Uh, so anyway, to finish this thing, we just use uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus, compute this thing here. And we get that this is 1. We can do that because this is the Riemann improper interval. Is it? Thank you. So uh, one, one important observation is the following. When you have the following improper integral, Riemann improper integral, this thing converges. Okay, it takes two days to prove it, but uh, it does converge. However, if you do this thing, this thing does not converge. Okay, this thing converges because you have lots of cancellation because of the sign. You take the absolute value, you kill the cancellations, and, and the thing blows up. So. Uh, you see, uh, the, so this is a function which is integrable in the sense of Riemann, but not for Lebesgue. It doesn't contradict our result. The problem is that it's improper. And the things we have said are about proper integrals. So that's why you need to be a little careful. However, if you are talking about positive functions, then it is the same, and as, uh, as the lemma there shows. OK, so that's, that's a little difficulty in that. OK, so uh, the review that, uh, did everybody get a review? So the review is a little bit about the same type of stuff, OK? Um, so to make you practice, this is a good homework, uh, if you have the correct uh, questions, at least. And uh, so, so make sure you understand that. So the plan from here is to do uh, the review on November 7, next week. So November 7, we'll have a review. November 14th, we'll have a test. November 21, we will not be here. And November 28th, uh, we will come back. You seem disappointed about November 21. It's, uh, it's uh, the, the day before Thanksgiving. How many classes after that before Only two, I think. Yeah, meeting once a week definitely shortens the class. That's, that's true. But hopefully you have learned some things. So let's go on with 2.4.
So different modes of convergence. Uh, we have already seen that Fn converges to F almost everywhere means that the set where Fn of x does not converge to F has measure zero. Fn converges to F in L1 if the integral of Fn minus F converges to zero as n goes to infinity. So uh, one, one interesting example is the following. Take Fn to be n, one, uh, zero, one over n. Oh, the other way. Huh. So let's, yeah. So we want 1 over n, 0 n. Hmm. So what we see here is that fn of x is 1 over n if x is between 0 and n, and 0 if x is bigger than n. Now, uh, for every x, there exists an n so that n is bigger than x, a comedian property. And such that, therefore, fn of x, so let's call it n naught, fn of x is going to be 1 over n for all uh, n bigger than n naught. Okay. Doesn't matter where your x is, after a certain rank, fn of x is going to be 1 over n. Therefore, fn of x converges to 0 for all x. Well, for, for the positive x, you need an argument. For the negative x, it's even easier because it's always 0. So you, you have nothing to do. OK? So this shows that fn converges to 0 almost everywhere. I mean, in this case, it's everywhere. Now, if we look at uh, uh, Fn minus 0, what do we get? Well, we get the integral, 1 over n, 1, 0, and dm. Okay, let's let's take a Lebesgue measure. Then this is one over n times n, which is one. This thing doesn't go to zero. So here is an example where the function goes to uh, zero almost everywhere, but not in L one. So Fn does not converge to 0 in L1.
Okay? Uh, what else? Yeah, let's look at an example where it converges to the inner one, but not almost everywhere. So, uh, well, we can write it formally, but it's better to draw a picture. You see better what's going on. Um, yeah, you, you divide your, so is it zero one that we divide on? Yeah, so what you do is you take well, your F1 is the indicator of zero half F2 indicator of uh, one half one then you do F3 is the indicator of zero one fourth F Four is the indicator of one fourth one half. F five is one half three fourth. F six is three fourth one. And you go on like this. F seven is going to be zero one eighth. F8 is going to be 1 eighth, 2 eighth. And so you keep slicing your interval 0, 1 in smaller and smaller pieces. Now, the, the maddening part is to reconcile the index of your sequence with the number of time you are slicing. You can write it formally. I mean, it's not that difficult, but uh, this requires a little of work. So I'm not going to do that, but just look at this. Now, what happens for a given x? Let's see that my x is sitting here. OK? It's, uh, so the first time around, it's uh, in the indicator of this guy. So it's worth 1 here and 0 here. Now, when I go to the second round, it's going to be in here, so it's going to be f3 of x is going to be 1, but f4 of x is going to be 0. f5 of x is 0, f6 of x is 0. Then here I'm going to have a 1, and then 0, 0, 0, 0, and so on. So at every step, you're going to get one, 1, and all the other guys are going to be zeros. So what can I say about fn of x? Can I say that fn of x converges to something? No, because I have a subsequence that goes to 1 and a subsequence that goes to 0. Okay, Because I can find infinitely many of these guys that will make this go to 0 and 1. So f of x does not converge. So this is a sequence I found that converges nowhere. Okay. On the other hand, if I look at my Fn minus 0, what happens? Well, it's going to be the indicator of a set. 
but the set is decreasing smaller and smaller. So this is going to be uh, equal to 1 over 2 to the k, where the k has a relation with the n. And what's important is that k, so k, let's put that this is a k to the n, where k to the n goes to infinity with n. That's what counts. Okay, it has a, it's a logarithmic. Uh, so what this tells me is that this goes to 0. So fn converges to 0 in our one this time. So these two examples show that almost everywhere does not imply L1 convergence. And L1 convergence does not, in, does not imply almost everywhere convergence. So if uh, our situation was not bad enough, now we're going to introduce a third notion of convergence, which is, which is actually going to reconcile the two of them, okay, which is weaker than both of them, and uh, which is quite useful, as uh, the homework problems will tell you. Okay? So let's stop here for 10 minutes, and then we'll come back.